we might say are good representations, justified and true. We might call them knowledge representations, warranted representation. And this is not meant to be technical, by the way. I'm just kind of tracking this knowledge notion. Uh, but again, warranted representation is where I, where I land in wanting to describe these. Um, and so it, it, it occurs to me that if I want to know what warranted means, I might, I might do something like this. Um, I might apply this notion of warrant and uh, try and figure out um, what a, a representation to be trusted is by asking the designer of a large language model system. And I might, I might ask, ask the designer some questions um, to help me figure out if I can be confident about the outputs of that system, uh, the representational outputs. And I think the question begins with this. Uh, I would ask, is your system designed to output veridical representations? And if they say yes, I then think, okay, well, could those representations be trusted? And I think, probably not, right? Because it's it may be designed to output that, but I, I want a little bit more before I know I can trust the representations without further scrutiny. I want to know that they can be, that, that it's designed to reliably output these representations. And that's going to be farther, farther down the road. Um, but, I, but I think even then, I would, I would want more, right? So it's designed to reliably do this, uh, but, but were they successful in, in this design, or you know, in, in designing you know, its reliability for out, to output reliable representations? And this is getting pretty close, I think. Uh, but even here, I think there's at least another piece, which is this question of, well, in what environments is it, is it designed to successfully uh, and reliably output vertical representations? Uh, and the last question is going to be, um, is the system actually operating in one of these environments? Right. So we have these, these five questions, and I want yes to all of these before I'm going to accept um, a representation that's produced by one of these systems as veridical without further scrutiny. So when I, when I take, take these considerations and I, and I think through this, I arrive at, at this notion here, right? And, I, and I'm applying it now to, um, I'm just going to say cognitive systems. A, a cognitive, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, cognitive systems. And what I mean by cognitive is, um, a, a cognitive representation is a representation that's trying to be veridical. So just work with me here in this, uh, you know, these, these unclear notions, but it's trying to be veridical. Um, so, you know, a, a process of proper cognitive functioning, which is what we would want from one of these models, is going to be a cognitive process of a type that has been successfully vetted or designed to reliably, in environments of given types, output vertical representations and is occurring in an instance of such an environment. Um, we had this term in the cognitive process ontology. Okay, so let, let's try and wrap our minds around this a little bit. Um, in, in terms of vetting, right, we might have evolutionary vetting. Um, all of my ancestors who couldn't form vertical representations with their sense perception died before they could, um, before they could reproduce. Right? So you have this vetting through natural selection uh, that, that might occur. Um, but you also have design, right? Uh, you have engineers that deploy um, sensors in environments, and there's knowledge of how those sensors are supposed to work. They're, they're vetted, they're designed, they're designed and vetted to work in a certain environment um, to get back reliably uh, you know, data that we can use to understand where the sensor is at. Um, and so sometimes this is, you know, this is planets. Sometimes it's uh, ophthalmological equipment for children, right? You know, similarly, you know, the engineer designs this, gets vetted through research, and eventually deployed um, broadly in clinics. Okay, um, and then uh, another kind of vetting, or another uh, outcome of, of vetting, and sometimes design has to do with language, and some of this is going to be. You know, something that looks more like vetting, but other times it's, it's going to look very design-like when you're working with formal languages and so on, where you you have these processes of communication and you're you're trusting that there's this reliable output um, of, of veridical you know, representations. 
Um, and there's a lot of dependencies here, like the person isn't lying to you, and so on. Okay, so crash course and warrant and you know proper functioning and so on. Uh, we can generalize this notion of cognitive functioning, process of cognitive, proper cognitive functioning, to this general notion of proper functioning, and we can talk about processes um, that aren't you know trying to produce vertical representations, uh, but instead are, are trying to produce something um, that meets a certain standard, right? Um, and we can say. You know, there, there's a process of a type that's been successfully better designed reliably in environments of given types or outputs that meet some standard and is incurring an instance of such an environment. Um, and with this notion in mind, we can begin to build a hierarchy where we have this process of proper functioning, which is a defined class, by the way, process of proper cognitive functioning, and then we get to this term uh, representation that is warranted. Um, which is going to be, uh, speaking loosely, a belief that's produced through a process of proper cognitive functioning. So it's produced by one of these vetted or designed processes that, that is successfully so to reliably produce veridical representations. Um, okay, so uh, just one more quick side note, this is an aside. Uh, what we can also do with this process of proper functioning notion is get a notion of uh, veridical copying or uh, faithful copying, canonicity, and so on. Um, this is in a paper called uh, Towards a Cyber Towards a Cyber Information Ontology. So um, uh, this is just an interesting uh, side venture branching off from this notion of the process of proper functioning. Um, okay, so back, back to Warren. So, so why is this important? What, what can we do with this? Uh, well, something we can do with this is we can use it in um, systems that want to track errors and want to do something with errors, do something useful with errors, and, and help us to know uh, the consequences of our mistakes, how to avoid them in the future, and so on. One such system would be a you know error tracking system and a reference tracking system. right? And so reference tracking, many of you have heard plenty about reference tracking, but just so we're on the same page, two central tenets of reference tracking, you name everything, so everything gets a, a UUID. Um, and you delete nothing. Um, and so you don't want to delete your errors, you want to keep them, and you want to be able to roll things back to appreciate what the errors did. So, so how is this done? Um, well, and we're going to get back, so I'm going to show how Warrant fits in here in a second. Uh, well, you build these layers of tuples, and I'm not going to talk about this too deeply, but feel free to ask questions later. Um, but you build these tuples, and you have an assertion, um, then you have an assertion about the assertion, um, and you have this second assertion uh, helps you track information like, uh, you know, is there any kind of error in the referred to assertion? So this top assertion is referring to this assertion, and this is going to help me understand whether this one has any errors in it, whether it's been replaced by other assertions, and so on. So say I, you know, spell your name incorrectly, and we need to fix that. Well, the initial misspelling would have a meta assertion that says, well, this one had a typo. So we replaced it by this other assertion. And we use layers of assertions to do this. Um, so you see here, uh, the, the, just, you know, the way this would work, um, through these abstract tuples, is the last two uh, values, one would be an integrity code. So you know, this tells us um, whether there's any error. And if there is, what kind of error and then the last one would tell us um, if there are any tuples that replace the one that's being referred to by, by this tuple. Okay. And I'll give a, right, so there's various types of errors that we might have uh, in a tuple, like the object doesn't exist, or the author thought it was relevant, but it's really not relevant, and so on. Okay, so let's, let's just look at a, a picture of this, because some people like pictures. Uh, so here, we're, we're noting that there is this instance of, uh, this says nurse practitioner, right? But the reality is below. Uh, well, when this gets asserted, we, we have the metadata that gets asserted along with it. And that P plus one code, if you were to look at the code table, means there's, there are no errors, right? So this is prior to any knowledge of errors. And there's a null value where the replacements would be, because there's no replacement. Because as far as the system is concerned, 
everything is correct. Well, we, we figure out that everything is not correct, and we create a second uh, metadata tuple that says, well, the referred to tuple has an integrity code of P minus four, or P dash four, um, and that means that there's a typo present. And that that assertion is gonna be replaced by a second assertion uh, with an IRI or UID of tuple two. And so we create that, and it gets its own metadata tuple, and we're off to the races. So when we, when we do the integrity code, the, the traditional way this is done is we ask these questions in order to generate the integrity code here. We say, does the portion of reality represented by the assertion objectively exist, yes or no? Is, it, is the represented portion of reality objectively relevant, yes or no? Does the author believe that the represented portion of reality exists? Does the author believe that the portion of reality represented is relevant? Is the assertion in the record tracking system the assertion intended by the author, right? If it's not the intended one, then it's probably a typo. Um, and then finally, in what way does the assertion in the record tracking system refer? Um, this one is, is gonna talk about empty reference and so on, right? And you, you ask these questions in order to get this, the integrity code, so, um, yes or no, uh, and, and finally, correctly, ambiguously, redundantly, and so on. Um, okay. So this is all about accuracy. And again, traditionally, and when we think about data, and we think about curating and understanding um, whether the data is good or not, we most often think about uh, whether it's true or false, whether it's accurate, um, whether it refers, and I think warrant adds, adds a new dimension to this that's really, really important. And, and here's why. So we look at this scenario where, where <laughs> Dr. Ann Smith diagnoses Mr. Jones with type 2 diabetes. And um, okay, right? Mr. Jones learned he has type 2, type, type two diabetes. This gets put in the system as so, right? And then we learn that though, though Dr. Smith was correct in the diagnosis, the equipment used to generate that, generate that diagnosis uh, was uncalibrated or broken or something of that sort. And so though what Dr. Smith diagnosed, was, the diagnosis is true, the doctor got lucky. And if we're only worried about accuracy, we can't capture this dimension. And so we should be worried about accuracy. And we don't know what to do when we, when we realize the doctor got lucky. If accuracy is all we're worried about, then I don't know what to do in the system to, to help appreciate that the doctor got lucky. And we want to appreciate this because we don't want to get diagnosed, have our correct diagnosis be just a matter of luck, right? Uh, this point was brought up by a paper by uh, Werner Koysters and, and Bill Hogan. I can't remember the year, but I think it's some, the title is something like uh, Diagnoses and Lucky Guesses. Uh, so check it out. Um, so, so Warren helps us uh, begin to, in a perspicuous way, in a way that can be apologized, uh, capture this dimension of truth maintenance, where we move beyond uh, the accuracy into this, this question of luck. Um, and a little review on Warren here. Okay, hope everybody got that. Um, and we can use these we can use these terms to begin to do that. Um, something else it does is it, it draws our attention in general to the process that precedes, you know, going out of the system, external to the system, um, that generated the representation. Right. Um, so. So we start with accuracy, then we move into, you know, well, was it lucky, or is it something that can be trusted without further scrutiny, uh, to this general appreciation of this process that extends what we hope is a, a proper process. Um, and and that, that helps us then ask questions like, okay, so, so this is true, and we didn't get lucky, but we realize the, the piece of the process traveled through um, 
you know, a, a competing healthcare practice that may want to feed us information that will will harm our healthcare practice, right? And even if it's accurate, even if it's not luck, just a matter of luck that we, we came to this conclusion, we, we're going to want to understand that one of the reasons we have this information is because this competing practice allowed us to have it, and that might mean that we need to be cautious in the way that we use it. So, just highlighting that. Okay. So, so what might we do with warrant when performing truth maintenance? Um, so we, we begin with some of the accuracy questions, right? Um, believes exist, believes relevant. This is the person putting it into the system. And then we go on to some warrant questions. And we ask the question, um, is the belief that it exists, is that warranted, yes or no? Is the belief that it's relevant, um, is that warranted, yes or no? Um, and, and depending on the answers, we have these warrant codes based on just the various combinations that are possible um, when you when you introduce the warrant questions. Um, now, interestingly, there are some cases where warrant just doesn't apply, right? So, um, if if the, the person doesn't believe the entity exists, then they can't believe that it's relevant, which means the the relevancy uh, the, is the belief that it's relevant. Warranted question is just not applicable, right? So. So we take all those questions, we take all those answers, um, put them in a grid, and we generate codes, right? And then we can use these codes to annotate, um, there we go, to, on the end of the integrity codes to give an extra dimension of truth maintenance and help us to appreciate more fully the state of our data and how well we're doing at representing reality. Um, and so this is why warrant's important, and this is a way that warrant can be applied in uh, data systems. So I'm just going to leave this stuff out. These are graphs setting up Alex's talk, but I'm going to pause there for questions because I'm not sure how much time I have left. Thank you. Enjoyed your talk, David. Um, I can feel the nods to Alan Boldman. Um, some stuff uh, to compensate for getting your cases being an environment of a given type. 